Chairman, uh, the next item, of course, is the proposed to tentative budget that we are requesting the uh, board pass as a tentative budget. As you know, our budget process requires a, when the superintendent gets in his mind a proposed budget, we uh, deliver that to you, and that was done on the 5th of May, and y'all have had it for almost a month. The next step in the process is the passage of the tentative budget, which uh, the first page in your package lays out the various funds, about six or seven funds of the school district. Okay, The first column, the, the general operating budget, is what we have traditionally spent most of our time on, but uh, the other <coughs> funds require your examination and passage. You can see from uh, the first page uh, what we are requesting as a tentative budget, uh, the T-sheets for the general operating budget indicated uh, anticipated revenue for the general operating budget for FY 14-15 of $801,547,000, and excluding the fund balance, excluding our estimated end of year 14 fund balance of 20007000 So. When you vote on this page, you will be recognizing the fund balance, but you're not putting that fund balance in an appropriation posture, in an expenditure posture, okay? The bottom of the first column indicates budgeted expenditures, again excluding the fund balance, of $800,144,877. Uh, and right now we're projecting an end of FY15 fund balance of $21,410,000. Now, the superintendent and I have had a number of discussions relative to what is an adequate fund balance and where will we really go or hopefully go at the end of 14, okay? We're using the 20 million. Right now, the trends indicate that will be exceeded or could be exceeded by $5 million. Again, we will know more as, we, as, as the months pass, okay? But please keep in mind the importance of the fund balance and what happened in FY12 when we went through the fund balance. An adequate fund balance on an $800 million budget, just adequate, not great, will be about $66 million, okay? So even if everything, you know, our, our hopes come true and we end up with a $26 million fund balance at the end of 14, we still have a very long way to go. And that consists of maximizing your revenue and controlling your expenses, okay? Um, especially, and, and, and on the agenda item, please keep in mind that the, Number to key on all the statements of the different funds is the billion thirty-eight million one hundred and seventy-seven thousand four hundred and seventy-five dollars. That is the total of the indicated amounts uh, on the first page of your agenda item. So uh, the projected ending fund balances at June 30, 2015, are not up in that number uh, at this point in time. The special revenue fund is primarily the grant funds. The debt service fund we talked about a little bit during the monthly report of $1,396,000. Uh, capital outlay, that's primarily the SPLOS projects. Right now it shows estimated total expenditures of $77,309,000. That, of course, came from the budget form documents submitted by facilities. And as they go through the year and they administer that, that number will move or, or could move. And that seems to be the practice here. School nutrition and athletics, uh, estimated expenditures of 52864 And finally, the trust and agency fund, which carries a lot of our benefit components in it, Medicare, some FICA, uh, PERS retirement, uh, and disability amounts, uh, estimated expenditures of $16,066,500. This tentative budget is really a summary sheet uh, of all the funds as we go forward uh, with the FY 14-15 budget process. Uh, the two sheets behind that, of course, are what we've come to call the T-sheets, beginning with the first mid-year adjustment that we've done where we added about $8 million to the budget 
uh, in the middle of this pass shift. As you can see up in the top left of that page was uh, the components of the fund balance, the 20 million 7,000, uh, which we feel we're gonna exceed that hopefully, unless there's some, something we're not seeing uh, when we close the books in 14. The projection of the $801 million is made up of two major components, your local revenue and your state revenue. You can see on that page, the local revenue is projecting a 3% digest growth at least, and additional uh, TAVT tax, uh, which is the auto licensing change the state made a couple of years ago, and an E-rate reimbursement, that's uh, an IT reimbursement program that Mr. Brantley has been working on to enhance revenue in that area. Those local revenue component, uh, along with the base local revenue from this year, will bring the local component to $403,274,000. The next major component, of course, is state revenue. As we're all aware, the governor uh, indicated uh, a prior year supplemental along with additional funding for local education. We have gotten some communications uh, from the state uh, informal or unofficial at this point, but in writing. And so we're using that QBE growth component of 15898 and in working with Dr. Preston relative to uh, better management of our student components, uh, we're projecting an additional $3 million to bring the state revenue component to 398273461 Those Two components, again, excluding the fund balance, will give us an $801,547,000 anticipation target. For appropriations, of course, that's the expenditure side. Uh, we're continuing some initiatives begun by the superintendent in terms of one, uh, control or reduction in legal fees. The $4,550,000 budget is reduced down to about $3,050,000 or a redirected savings amount of $1,500,000. The uh, other enhancements, as you can see on the page, are uh, school safety enhancements, uh, additional SRO uh, officers, some additional police cars, extra pay for crossing guards, uh, nursing and health care components, pedestrian walkways in front of this building, carbon monoxide monitoring, okay? The, uh, School safety enhancements have a subtotal of about $2,122,000. The top of the third page in, which is the second page of the T-sheets, kind of indicates your direction and the superintendent's direction to do away with furlough days for teachers. We have funding in this proposed budget of about $12 million to do that. The, uh, we're going to use an RT3, uh, again, furlough day reduction of $2 million seven, and a, taking out an additional three uh, furlough days for teachers, a total of about $12 million is going into furlough day reductions. This budget, as proposed, will not have any furlough days set aside for the teaching staff uh, and will also uh, take away all furlough days for janitors and secretaries as we go forward. You can see there's an $8 million additional, excuse me, additional amount of money for class size reduction or the funding for approximately 100 teachers, media specialists, and other. One of the things you've heard me talk about is uh, the concern I've had is that traditionally we had overspent in salaries in the school district. And looking at the process, what was determined was finance division with size salaries or the salary budget by the jobs file, okay? And then specialists like Dr. Preston would work on allotments, okay? And then through the process, okay, we'd come here and ask y'all to vote on a jobs file budget and then allotments would be refined and oftentimes they didn't match up. Well, this year we took some extra time and merged or compared the allotment information with the jobs file, okay? And what came out of it was a possibility of a need on allotment basis for at least an additional $8 million, okay? All right, and so that has been added into the budget formula and it could accommodate uh, up to 100 teachers, which of course will give us some classroom size reduction and increase uh, the teaching uh, force, uh, hopefully to lead to better student, uh, improved student performance. 
all the items that you can see that you're used to seeing in terms of academic enhancements are $5.3 million for textbooks, uh, additional training uh, for our principal secretaries, uh, the elimination of a third year step, step back, which was begun, begun a number of years ago. We're not going to uh, institute that step back in terms of pay. Uh, funding for the International Baccalaureate Program and for school choice. So you can see the school-based academic enhancement subtotal uh, on page three, the third page in, numbered page two, is a total of $23,326,476. Finally, there's a 1% uh, a cost of living allowance that will impact all employees. We've all read the stories of the other school districts in the area that have taken advantage of their digest growing, giving pay raises and doing away with furlough days, and this budget does the same thing. The 5805000 will put in place funds for 1% COLA for all employees in the school district. Um, there we, we, we stated early on that we would uh, take a reduction in the central office discretionary budgets. This budget assumes that $5 million savings and redirects those funds in order to pay for uh, some of the enhancements that I've described. Uh, keep in mind that the $15 million eight that I described early on that the state has indicated we should get, uh, that's great, but there are some state mandated costs that we have to cover. There's an additional retirement or a TRS contribution of three million nine. There's additional state salary uh, increases of two million one sixty. Uh, there's a uh, an additional charter school. When we take a look at what the state says we have to send to our charter school, there's an additional two million four. Uh, bringing our charter school pass throughs to about twenty nine million dollars from twenty six million dollars, and then we have funding for a specific uh, charter school tapestry. We're carrying that at $800,500 at this point. So overall, you know, we've got $800 million, in projected expenses. And of course, we'll be bringing a mid-year adjustment to you, hopefully, uh, as we administer this budget and manage to this budget, uh, in the event y'all approve it as is, with anticipated revenue of $801,547,000, again, excluding the fund balance. Is there any discussion? Mr. Mayfield. Yeah, thank you um, for, the, for the presentation, Dr. Bell. Uh, and these are, these are, this is um, a really good breakout. I think there are two things that I would ask for, uh, and it's maybe more of a board discussion than it is specific to you. And that is one, um, we see the, the breakouts in terms of where the enhancements are, uh, and being able to sort of translate that for the public, if you will, uh, Mr. Superintendent, looking for language that might speak to how these enhancements will, in fact, address academic performance or academic achievement, I think, in, in sort of layman's terms, I guess, would, would be helpful. Uh, I guess the second question or request uh, to the board, uh, maybe for consideration, not necessarily for discussion at any great length here, uh, but is to understand how the other division's budgets uh, aligned with the goals for those divisions and how they contribute or intend to contribute to either greater efficiencies or academic achievement so that the net effect of understanding the budget translates into some op an operational set of language, I guess, if you will, for, for helping the public to understand what will, what will result from this. And then I guess the third piece is the piece that we've talked about in our meetings about what the board needs in terms of uh, support uh, to uh, sort of mitigate some of the challenges that we may have posed for staff by asking for certain reports and certain information uh, that they may not be staffed to handle, uh, that we might carve out um, <coughs> rough numbers of somewhere around um, uh, $250,000 for uh, a resource uh, that would be a sort of a high skill resource that would help us actually identify and actually aggregate board requests for information and, and facilitate um, uh, getting us those reports. And so it's really, I guess, a, a, a looking for a response, I guess, from other board members on whether or not uh, these considerations should be added to uh, our, our um, 
adoption of the preliminary budget. I guess the next person, Mr. Coleman. Actually, didn't have a specific response to that, so I'll raise a, a couple of other questions, and then I'd love to hear the responses to that as well. Dr. Bell, one of the, the things that um, just leaps to mind for me as we're considering the budget that I'd like to hear you talk through for a minute is obviously we're on a razor-thin margin in terms of matching our costs for next year and our revenues for next year. So we're only adding about a million dollars to the fund balance uh, because of the enhancements to the budget. Um, that entails thinking about about a 5% increase from the amended budget and overall revenues. And I thought it was a very helpful breakout between uh, state revenues and local revenues. I understand the QBE estimates will come from the state. I was hoping that you might just talk us through in a bit more detail uh, how you guys think about the local sources of revenue, um, your level of confidence in our ability to kind of get those enhancements over the coming year, and then if for, for any reasons uh, that revenue was coming in lower than expected, uh, what uh, remediation of that would look like mid-year. I know we've talked about this mid-year budget adjustment, so just kind of talk me through the process for estimating and then acting on revenue as it's coming in uh, and your level of confidence in that kind of 5% increase over the amended budget for 14 to the revenues we're expecting for 15. Does that make sense? Yes, sir, Mr. Coleman. Um, thinking about where the county and the district is in the economy and thinking about the substantial financial impact of the Great Recession that we've all been through. Keep in mind that I think in around 2008, our tax, taxes bill, the tax levy, was around $500 million. Think about for 13, the tax levy was about $375 million. And that's with a one mill property tax increase. So there's been a substantial dislocation in terms of our local revenue. Now, you've heard me say that this budget projects a 3% increase in the tax digest and that we have to legally take certain steps, and we've begun that process. And I want to thank you all. You all passed your intent to go above the rollback grade in a previous meeting. Uh, all indications are that the 3% digest growth, after all the appeals are documented and heard and stuff, will probably be exceeded right now. No promises, okay? So we certainly have taken the pain, and I think the school district needs to retain the better news on the economy in terms of digest growth in order to rebuild our fund balance and to do certain things that the superintendent and the board has indicated we needed to do to improve morale in the workforce. I would, be, I would agree with you that this would be a pretty aggressive budget had we included that fund balance in our revenue for expenditure, but we did not do that, okay? We did not do that. Uh, and so we've, we've completely sort of set it aside. Uh, if the revenue is not coming in as we project, then of course we will come back to you at mid-year, right? And ask for certain adjustments. Now, if it's, if it's that kind of an adjustment, then it could be painful because we may, we'd have to also uh, ask for cuts in certain areas. Didn't have to do that this past mid-year. We asked for additions in certain areas, uh, and it looks like we're going to better our projected revenue as we close the books, okay? The art in all of this, of course, is to collect more than you say you're going to collect and to spend less than you project you're going to spend. That's what it's all about. And certainly, when you consider our position, you've got to manage it in that fashion. So. Uh, I, I, it is, it's a, it's a, you know, a strong budget. I wouldn't say it's overly aggressive because we are uh, holding the fund balance out of the expenditures, expenditure stream. And I do think there's going to be good news in terms of the local digest uh, as we go forward. Uh, and certainly in terms of this new TVAT tax that the state passed, uh, apparently there was a great deal of pent up uh, desire for people to buy new cars. And we, you know, projected a $3 million bump in it this year, and it's going to come in 9 or 10. So at some point, everybody's going to have a new car in their garage, and it's going to stop. The trick is knowing when that happens. The final request I'd have just along the lines of Mr. Mayfield is we've talked for a while now about formalizing the mid-year budget process, so putting in board policy somewhere kind of a 
process we would follow for updating the board on uh, mid-year adjustments, maybe before a year in. Um, it's a busy season right now, but just as a, a logging something, uh, once we work through this budgetary process, it would be great to see the staff kind of come forward with a recommendation for what type of formalization that, that could be um, so that we can consider that late summer or in the fall. Mr. Orson. Dr. Bell, how are you today? Um, I just Sorry. want to follow up on a couple things we talked about, I think, last month and also during the agenda setting. Um, and, I, and I think what the clarity you provided here is really great. I think it's important. I think it's great that the tax digest seems to be rebuilding. I think your comment about the value of a mill still being greatly diminished is really something we need to make sure everyone understands mm -hmm. because I think they look just at the millage rate and don't understand that there's been a huge diminution in the value of the mill over the past five years. The flip side of that, what we've talked about, even when we agree to go uh, set the millage rate above the rollback rate is to at least be thinking going forward, not necessarily tomorrow, but to have a plan so as if we continue, the health of the system continues to improve, that we get our fund balance and to pl the place where we need to be. We also look at ultimately how do we also provide relief to our taxpayers because part of the budget was built up on the old board increasing the millage rate out of necessity because of the diminution of the tax revenues. And I just think we need to be clear with the public that we understand that and that at some period of time we have a plan or we're developing a plan so that they know that they will not only be the uh, beneficiaries of what we expect to be a great school system but also of a reasonable tax rate of, in their mind. And I just think that the more we can do that, the more we're demonstrating some for, forward thinking on this, the better we'll be able to serve our constituents. And so, so in the same vein, kind of uh, related to Mr. Mayfield's comment about having tools for budgeting, you know, we've talked about specific budget items. I know every board member has had things that they think of our interest. And I think I feel, for example, ill-equipped to say what the impact of those would be. And I'll throw out, you know, my example of school nurses in middle and possibly high schools, because that's one where I think a lot of people were shocked that we don't have school nurses in middle and high school. And I think it's particularly uh, an issue in our middle schools. You know, high schoolers at least are becoming older. And I'd like to know, and I, I hope I can speak for our board members, what would it cost us if we wanted to make that adjustment in this budget? You know, I don't think any of us want to make, offer that as a proposal without any real concrete information. So right now, I guess to Mr. Mayfield's point, we're sort of stuck because we don't have the tools to figure that out. And we, at the same time, while we don't want to overburden you, but we have to rely on the administration to be able to help us understand the impact of decisions like that. And so I think we, we need to figure that out uh, as, a, as a board. How do we get that information that provides a fair balance for the burden it places on the administration, while at the same time gives us sufficient information to make informed choices. Because there may be other things in this budget that collectively as a board we think should be added to the budget or subtracted. And we, it's, we can see the subtractions because they're already in the proposed budget, but we can't see the additions without concrete information. And you're at, at this moment in time, you all are the only ones in a position to help us understand that. And so I think Again, to Mr. Mayfield's point, we just need to figure out how we're going to address those things so that by the time we get to the final budget, if the collective will is to have an addition, we're, not, we're doing so on an informed basis. Mr. Campbell. Dr. Bell, great job, as been said by my colleagues here. I have one simple question for you on the T accounts where you do the RT3 adjustment. It's a wash, 27, 2.7 million. Explain that to me again. I see the debit side of it, then I see the credit side, but I'm not fully understanding what you're doing with that transaction. Yes, sir. Uh, this is an initiative uh, begun by Dr. Beasley to use RT3 grant funds to bring the workforce in on a previously scheduled furlough day to do professional development training. So. <clears throat> We incur the salary obligation to make that payment, but to use the grant, all the appropriate documentation has got to come into finance by name, by employee number, by charge code for each individual that shows up. And then we 
draw out of the RT3 grant and reimburse ourselves for the cost of that professional development debt. That's why it shows an expense of $2.7 million and then a reimbursement of $2.7 million. Thank you. Let me follow up. Uh, Mr. Mayfield asked the board response to his suggestion, and it has been a conversation I think you and I have had for a number of months. I look at it from the accountant side from where, where Dr. Bell sits, but I think about some of the conversation that I had with Sachs a few weeks ago when they were asking us about how well have we done as a board. Um, in particular, when we talk about some of the costs that we've incurred, it's been great. We've done the universal screening and some of the other projects. One of the questions that I got from the accrediting agency was, how well are they doing? And I think it speaks to what you are asking is, we're showing some great initiatives from a board perspective, but if we get in and say, how well are those tools working? How can we address that? And I know you said to me that some, that's been some of the, the uh, questions that you've gotten from the public is, we're doing great things, but how do, how, how do we know how well they're working? How do we know if they're working well? And I think that addresses what you're looking at. I don't know. I think Mr. Orson may have touched on it uh, a little bit. Uh, from a board perspective, we can ask staff, and I have, I have every bit of confidence in, in the superintendent and the staff, but when they can't give us some of the answers that we've asked for, how are we going to be able to say to accrediting agencies and to some of the publics that we, that we speak to, we can actually say it's measured by this, or this is the, the uh, level of improvement that we've seen because we made some of these investments in some of the tools that we purchased for this. Dr. Marley. Uh, Mr. Mayfield, most certainly I agree with, with what you were talking about and Mr. Orson, because we do, one of the things that I had requested and we've talked about from the beginning was having a board administrator. And I think, you know, we were given an opportunity as a board to be able to say what would we look for and what would we want to see in the budget. And I think a lot of times we have not because we ask not is to have compiled a list of things. I already knew that there were nurses, no nurses in the middle, of the, but as an educator, they just never, that's across the nation, because it's always been an extra added cost. I really believe that there should be. But then I think these are the questions that we have to begin to ask beforehand, instead of reacting, being proactive to whatever we're looking for, and to be able to look at what would it cost to have asked that question. It might have been a burden, but I think that we wouldn't get at the 11th hour. Now we're wondering what would it cost to have those additions in the budget. It's actual questions and be able to find a way to have been, get the answers to them. The other thing is also making sure that if we're going to ask them, we want to have, have that take place in the budget is to go to the superintendent. This is, this is the leader is to be able to say, here are the things that we're looking at, here's what we're needing, can it actually take place? What will it take in order for it to take place? How much would it cost for it to take place? And I think too often, uh, I get concerned, it's sort of like in hindsight, in retrospect, that we're asking the questions that should be asked before, or following up on them, because you mentioned Orson, uh, Mr. Uh, Orson, uh, many months ago about the, the nurses and everything, but it seemed as if there was nothing, it was almost like it was put out there, but until we actually ask the question, put it forward and request a response and that something is done, I don't think it's going to happen. But then when we get to the 11th hour, it's hard to go back now when we're in the process of deciding this budget for next year that we want to know what will take place. Now I agree that we still need the answers, but then how will it impact what we're trying to do at this particular time. And I think that's what we have to be mindful of, is that we have to make sure that we follow through on certain things, but we also have to realize, and in, in, uh, going along with, with David's question about universal screeners and all of that, when you're talking about human beings and talking about people, people don't change just like that, and growth is incremental. It's not something that actually happens overnight. And so there are many influences and there are many, many impacts on student achievement, student growth. And a universal screener won't be the only thing. And I think as educators and people who are non-educators, you have to get to the point to recognize that if we keep trying to hold just what's going on in the classroom as an indication of student achievement, student assess, success, and student growth, we're going to be disappointed because there are too many different variables. And when you have a program or a project, you have to have short-term studies and you have to have longitudinal studies. And so unless we're in the position to be able to request short-term as well as longitudinal studies to be able to understand the impact, and then you have to control some of the variables that it would take in order to understand what is the overall impact. What about parent involvement? 
What about what's going on in that student's home? What about emotional, psychological issues? There are so many other things that we'll have to look at. And if we're just looking at and wanting a direct answer and say, well, will universal screener change all around? It probably will not. But what we really want to be able to understand, the impact, if it's a small percentage and you add it to the rest of the percentages and it increases what we're looking at, it makes a difference. You also have to begin to look at controlling a student's actual motivation. Well, that's hard to do unless you're in the field of mental health. Looking at student motivation, where does the counselors come in all of that? So I think a lot of times what we're looking for is this instantaneous result of what a particular test or an instrument will do, we're probably gonna be disappointed. But as educators, we've got to begin to be realistic. There's a whole world, a whole country, and then there's DeKalb County trying to get in, have student academic success, looking at student growth, looking at student achievement, looking at graduation, trying to you know, uh, up the graduation rate and all that. There are too many variables to be able to say that we can look at one thing and hold this system so accountable and on the backs of teachers and the backs of educators and administration to say, you all have got to prove to me exactly whether this works or not. So unless we're as a board ready to say, we're gonna put the money out there to get this type of research done, then we've got to begin to look and think real cautiously about what we're asking for. Uh our superintendent wanted to respond, and then Mr. Austin. Uh, just a couple comments on uh, what's been said. So as we've been out in public a lot lately, people want to see these benchmarks coming from the Universal Screener because we've been touting the Universal Screener as one of the great purchases of the year. So I understand that there are a lot of variables that are involved in it, but at some point, we're going to have to have a collection of data. At some point, we'll have a collection of data, but what is that timeline that we're going to wait to get that data? So that's what we need to really discuss. Also, back to Mr. Mayfield and the uh, resource for the board, and I'll refer this to the superintendent. Is it too late to include that into the budget? Uh, let me ask, uh, answer the question uh, regarding the universal screener and accountability and so forth. Ultimately, with school district, it's growth and achievement. At the end of the day, that's what we are judged by. And we all know that the state offers two excellent assessments of how our children are doing. For the elementary and the middle schools, it's the C CRCT. And for high schools, it's the EOCT. And it's your graduation rates. That's this business. Nothing else, I mean, there are other things, but at the end of the day, what the public is asking is how are our students doing? The good news is that the future is now. The new scores are being <laughs> evaluated as we speak. Now, the fact is, the universal screen has only been in place a few months. You're not gonna move the world and, and, and hang the moon in six months. But what we can do is determine whether or not we are growing or improving. And it, with the superintendent's report this evening, uh, I think uh, Dr. Beasley will be able to provide you, number one, with a timeline as to what has occurred since January. And I think he's going to say that we are encouraged by what we have already seen. That you don't really need to create new data. We need to understand the data that currently exists. And we will have the most up-to-date data you can imagine over the next two to three weeks. And to be honest with you, I don't think anyone on this board or anyone who is uh, earnest uh, in their evaluations will be disappointed. We're not where we were, but we need to be. But I can commit to you based on what I've been informed is that we are moving in the right direction. So any investment that this board made, uh, don't take my word for it but I think you'll hear the first iteration of that in the superintendent's report today. I, is that fair? That's fair. I mean, I, I don't know of any other evaluation that could be more prominent or significant uh, to stakeholders and parents and voters and anyone else because ultimately that's what the media judges us by. Isn't it? Yes. Now, uh, to the point uh, regarding enhancements, uh, and 
recognize now that having some money to spend is a relatively new phenomenon in the case. Right? And as was stated earlier by Mr. Coleman, uh, which he referred to as a razor thin situation, we're not, we don't need to be, and we're not in a position to become spendthrifts. Uh, but the enhancements that have been proposed uh, are, are items that really have been evaluated, considered, and addressed throughout the school year. As we built this year, we were looking towards next year. Now, we've actually done significant research on school nurses and the costs associated with it. And, uh, you know, and the relative value and value of it, you know, is one child being healthy, right? And if it's my child, then there is no amount of money I would not spend to ensure that my child is healthy and safe and lives a fulfilling life. Uh, but at the same time, one of the things that we have done some uh, research, and uh, it's an item that, depending on how many nurses, and no item, it's impossible, I don't think, to put a nurse in every school now. I'll be honest with you, it's just too big a number for us to really reasonably. We've looked at floating nurses, and it's still an item between eight hundred and four hundred thousand dollars and $400,000. But what I'm working on is that I think we need to really rethink how we're looking at this issue. Uh, why do we have to hire the nurses? That's kind of old school. And they are health care providers who provide nursing services. So what we're looking at is, I think, a more economic and efficient way to deal with it will be to, if possible, if there's someone available to contract with a health care nursing provider who can provide the same services. And we don't need to hire another nurse with an emergency kit to sit in a room, right? Because you got to finance the support that goes with it. Whereas you, through contract, could contract with an entire agency that has a much broader range of services and expertise. Uh, you know, it's not a one-moment deal. I mean, we got a mid-year adjustment. We got a new budget season. And if it's something we didn't want to do, and I don't think anyone's opposed to it, I'm not. I mean, how can you be opposed to it? I, it just makes too much sense. But uh, it's a matter of, uh, number one, being able to live with Dr. Michael Bell in terms of expenditure and at the same time build the enhancements that we need. So, and I don't have any problem with it. We are looking at it. We've looked at hiring the nurses, but I think that's kind of old school, to be honest with you, in the 21st century. And we could easily contract with one of the major healthcare providers to do the same if it's gonna be on a rotating, non-permanent basis. So what we wanna do is look at all of these options and then go with the one that's gonna provide the greatest amount of services for the most reasonable investment. Uh, one of the things Dr. Johnson al has always told me is you can't fix it all today. Even when you know it needs to be fixed. There's, there's a long list that I wanted to have on enhancement, but you just can't fix it all today and build a trust fund, um, a fund balance all at the same time. Now, and finally to uh, the resource, and that's, that's a board decision in terms of whether or not they want a resource person, but the resource person would then have to turn around and ask Dr. Bale. They can't get the information themselves. We still have to maintain a separation. They'd still be an employee of the DeKalb County School District, right? And maybe Ms. Margaret needs some help, but that's a board decision. But it won't change the, the reality that there is a separation between the board and the administration, what Dr. Campbell and Mr. Campbell spoke to. And we're still not fully accredited. I've said it, you all have heard me say it again. We made a lot of progress, fund balance, all probation. That just make us normal. This is what school districts should be. We're not exceptional yet. Now, we will be, but we're not today. So we need to understand what normality looks like and continue to build for the future. This is the, the fact that we can say we're ending a school year in a general fund balance. The general fund balance was about $3 million last year. Right, so it wasn't a whole lot of things you can do with three million dollars in a billion dollar operation. But now that we're at 20, things begin to look different. And looking forward, I just see great things for the district. And we just had to do what we've done. We know how to do it. And we're looking at the nursing. I like the idea, to be honest with you. I think we need it. But let's look beyond what we normally do. Because see, many of our nurses aren't nurses. 
to that fair. The, the public, I should, you know, may not want to know that many of the nurses aren't nurses. <laughs> They're allied helpers, which is okay, because typically what happens, so if we want nurses or highly trained individuals, then we have to think about how we can afford it. In a pri maybe even from the private, public, private kind of partnership. Mm -hmm. I think it would be unique for us to do it. Actually, we can teach other school districts how they can afford it. The problem, the reason we can't afford it, is it everybody trying to hire a nurse at every school? Because then I got to pay the benefits. What else I got to pay, Dr. Wilson? TRS, when if it's a contract, just like the home health care providers, I don't have to pay. I mean, you don't have to pay that. And it's much more economic and we get lo a lot more coverage. So I hope I answered some of the questions. But yes. I think Dr. B's on this return on investment. The superintendent report will provide you an insight and in two weeks once the scores are actually released once they are official uh, we are very hopeful that we've seen progress across the district I know, you, <laughs> I know you do mr campbell i was saving that i knew i said Let me, if i'm speaking to mr campbell i gotta use the term roi the <laughs> roi right I had to look it up the first time he used it on me, but I said, what is ROI? I didn't want to tell you I didn't know, but I got it now. I got it. Mr. Arson. Uh, yeah, just a couple of quick things. Uh, thank you for the update of the nurses, because I, and I'm encouraged because I think you're right. We need to look at, you know, innovations that are available, but both on the private sector, by proximity to healthcare providers. I mean, we have schools that are close to major healthcare providers. Is there a way to partner with the Emory University facilities with the cab medical. I mean, I think all those things should be on the table to provide the kind of coverage I think our kids need. And I appreciate the budget constraints and also looping schools together that are in close proximity. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, we need to set a new model that doesn't probably exist anywhere. I'm encouraged to hear that we're working on it. And I think it ju just goes to the pro issue that Mr. Mayfield raised, which is we haven't perfected our information system yet. I know we've been, we've been, filling in the holes a lot. There's a lot been going on. So that, that's not a criticism. I think it's just something that's an observation that part of it, again, from a board perspective is there's not a clear mechanism for getting information and that's something we're all seeking to improve. A couple, of, just two small other things. One was, I know we'd raised the question about the, the SRO cars and whether that money could be shifted to SPLOST. And I think I just wanted to get an update on that and then I have one other question after that. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Arson, after your question, we had conversations with facilities and the, the SRO vehicles. Uh, I think we had an allowance for so much in terms of service vehicles this year and that money is, uh, excuse me, the next year and that money has been taken. So we don't see an opportunity to be able to use SPLOS money on the, uh, the SRO cars. Okay, because I, I know in the SPLOS budget, and I, and I know we're in tricky situations. We'll see, and some other things. So I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not an advocate as opposed to. I just want to make sure that, to the extent we have the ability to categorize within SPLOS, we know that, for example, SPLOS collections will exceed what the original SPLOS budget was, but so are going to be costs. And I know it's a, it's a very delicate dance. But uh, again, this is a category that clearly, based on our own precedent, could be shifted to SPLOS. Whether it should be is a question we defer to all of you. But I just think. We at least need, should have the question on the table. But the last, which goes to the, uh, Dr. Irwin's comment, your comment, which is about kind of the, the Mr. Campbell's comment about return on investment, I think this goes to the longstanding conversation we've had about metrics, which is, Dr. Morley, I think you're right. We can't see an instantaneous response, but I think as we, if, as we start to develop the habit of trying to put metrics into our proposals, so at least we can set expectations, and even if we fall short, because we will at some times, at least then we'll have a benchmark for knowing where we fell short. And I think, you know, it's easy now for us to look back and say, well, on the universal screener, we should have had a set of metrics. And part of that was because, you know, Satch is telling us to have a universal screener, so we were running very quickly. But as a, as a matter of course, I think it does perhaps indicate a basis for why we should, in any of these type of proposals, try to have a set of expectations that are built into the proposal, including metrics, so that we can come back 
and say where are we at and at over what time period so that we also, again, to Dr. Morley's point, we're setting realistic time periods, that it's not going to happen overnight, but what do we expect this universal screener, just by example, to help us do over a three-year period? What, what's it going to move for us in regard to that? And that's not a, I'm not asking you to answer that, but more of a mindset as we have proposals come before the board. Just in addition, uh, Mr. Orson, um, it, uh, I hope we all can recall when we um, asked the superintendent to align all programs to the budget. And as the programs are aligned to the budget, then uh, these programs are assessed and evaluated um, yearly. So um, I'm assuming that that process is still in place, uh, um, Mr. Superintendent. Uh, absolutely, Mr. Chair, and, and hopefully I didn't oversimplify it, but you know, what I heard the chair and the board saying, we want to improve growth and achievement for all children. We want to improve our graduation rate. We want to be better stewards of the taxpayer dollars. And I think on each one of those categories, that's exactly what is occurring. And I hope when the data is published, uh, made public, but t we know about the budget, but the, the ultimate, the bottom line of the graduation rate, the growth and achievement of students, everything should align because that's the ultimate metric. Because if you get those two metrics, those three right, then that means things are aligned and moving in the right direction. We've been challenged by the fact that we hadn't gotten those metrics right. Our graduation rate hasn't been improving enough. Our growth has not been there and achievement is on the perform. I'm not, isn't that the business we're in? And luckily, we have very clear, concise uh, tests and assessment that can and I've said this to the, uh, my staff when I first came. That's it. That's the game. You win in that game, you win. If you don't, you lose. It's simple. It's your graduation rate. It's how these students are doing in the class. And nothing else much matters. I can talk a good game, but at the end of the day, if those things are improving, then it doesn't matter what I say or what we say. <laughs> right? Correct. Thank you, Mr. Superintendent. I, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, you, Mr. Superintendent and staff for including the custodians and the secretaries. Uh, you heard us loud and clear and you heard uh, the custodians and the secretaries, 12 month secretaries and custodians um, in the category to eliminate their fur furlough days. And I, I wanna thank you and your staff for including that. The budget, um, and Mr. Mayfield, I'm gonna get to at some point um, in this discussion to address your specific question as to whether or not to add an additional uh, support person, board support person uh, in this particular budget. Uh, right. But, but I will finish, I, I will do that at the end, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, Mr. Coleman. I just had a no, I think, if, I mean, if we're going to have the discussion later, I think that would be the appropriate time to right. make additional comments. My comment was on that point. I was going to make a 60-second recommendation, which is, look, the, I have a very high hurdle rate for adding someone not in a classroom at this point. And so if we were to take a step like that, I would actually prefer to scope out exactly what that person's going to do, a job description, you know, et cetera, before we were to add it, because I'd actually hope it would be the type of position we could get a return on investment for that it would lead to savings that would offset the cost. Um, and so that that was what was rolling through my head. I mean, in the budget, I'm a little uh, indifferent because I know it's a, going to be a relatively small line item, but it would be interesting to scope out what that person would do and get a better sense of their responsibilities and their activities before, uh, before I would feel terribly comfortable adding them, I think. Since you did mention it, I'll open the floor for a further discussion on this particular item, uh, if you will, uh, relative to um, Mr. Uh, uh, Mayfield's um, suggestion. So we are going to discuss it now? We're discussing it now. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, the, well the, uh, I guess the point that I'd like to make. Uh,
I guess the point that I'd like to make is that um, you know some of the discussion that we've had centered around specific results. Um, that's not the nature of the request. I certainly respect the the, um, the addition or to the comments from from Mr. Coleman. I think that's appropriate. Uh, what I'm concerned about, though, is that if we don't do it in this cycle, um, this is a preliminary budget, and what I'm proposing is that we do just that. That we um, reserve, if you will, uh, $250,000 for that purpose, whether or not that is completely a staff person or some combination of vendor services and or tools, uh, that we would have a way to aggregate or resource, if you will, to aggregate board requests for information and to the degree that is possible either through policy or through some under clarification of SAC's interpretation of what micromanagement is, uh, that we might have access to some of the data directly uh, so that this resource could actually uh, reach, get the data as opposed to having to make a request uh, on the part of the staff, which has been one of the challenges to, to getting some of that information. So I agree, we do need to have a job description. Uh, uh, and I'm suggesting that we, before this budget process is completed, that we have such a job description uh, to accompany the specific dollar request. Mr. Superintendent. I think it's a great idea, but the board should re be reminded the board has only one employee. This person would be an employee and would be supervised directly and indirectly by the superintendent as of every other employee in the district. So I'm trying to understand. Uh, I guess Margaret needs some help. Yeah, but I'm just saying, you can add a person, which is fine, but we need to be real clear that the board has only one employee. Right. No, and that, I don't think, was clear because council raised the concern, and the public should be cl made clear that what you're suggesting is that, to Mr. Coleman's point, we add another employee in the school district. That would be hired as any other employee uh, in the school district and ultimately hired by the superintendent. Yeah, I, I don't think that's, that's a, 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 certainly not, I'm not proposing that the board hires a person for themselves. I'm saying that, the, that there would be a resource that would be designated to support the board for the purposes of gathering, of aggregating the request for information that the board has, that that would be their role in the organization because of the demand that seems to be uh, creating problems for the current staff. Well, I'm not, uh, I want to disagree. I, I think we've been very uh, timely in responding to responsible requests, timely uh -huh. requests. Now, if we get a request at 10 a.m. on the morning of the board meeting, which we did today, we can't respond to it. I, I don't think it would be fair. And the board set up a time process by which requests should come in. But if we get six pages of requests at 10 a.m. for a 2, 8, 2 p.m. board meeting, I mean, I, I don't think that's a fair expectation. Yeah, I'm, 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 well, that, that's certainly not what I'm referring to. I'm oh, referring okay. to the, the request that, you know, that we've made over the course of the year where we've had challenges getting the information. And so I'm not requesting that we do any, you know, sort of last-minute requests for information and therefore place those demands on the staff. What I'm asking for is a resource for the board um, to aggregate board requests so that we consolidate those requests so that we can streamline the data that we're asking for and to your point uh, help to make sure that, that that information is requested for in a timely manner. Yeah, all due respect and I understand what you're saying but I don't want it to appear as if and I don't recall receiving any type of correspondence from board members complaining uh, that staff has not responded. In fact over the last few months I recall multiple comments of appreciation from board members that staff responding to inquiries. Now, if I missed something, I apologize for it, but that doesn't negate the fact that if the board wants to hire or add another position in the administration assigned to this purpose, that's fine. It's, it's, it, but I don't want it to appear uh, that somehow we are not responding in a timely manner in the ways that we can. Some of the requests require so much time and energy from Dr. Bell and other staff, uh, we're trying to run a district. And it's something Dr. Morley talks about a lot. 
And then when we respond to the request, we never hear anything else from them again. I just find that to be a little bit insulting and unfair. Because if it's important enough to the request to come and you spend hours gathering the information and then nothing ever comes of it. And you all know that to be true. Mm -hmm. I, I am, and I, I mean, and I'm defending because I don't have to do the work. I'm defending my staff who actually has to go out and do the work. I, I have no problems with adding 14,600 and number 79 employee to the district, if that's what the board wants to do. Uh, I don't, I think though, to Mr. Coleman's point, it would be good to get the metrics before you make the decision to appropriate the money, because I hear that a lot coming from up here. And to do otherwise would be inconsistent with everything I've heard for the last 16 months. Dr. Marley. Um, I'm here, sorry, did you finish? Okay. I, I, I guess here again, you know, I have to reiterate, you know, what, what we're here about, you know, what we're here for. I think that, again, we have to stop waiting until the 11th hour and coming up with suggestions. And all due respect, Mr. Mayfield, um, there has been time, and we've been, this board has been operating for about 14, almost 15 months. And if there was a request, this request has to be timely, it has to be appropriate, and it has to fit the needs. I think instead of looking at uh, hiring someone else and putting that in the budget, I don't feel comfortable with it, and I go along with um, Mr. Coleman. I think that it's something that needs to be researched, needs to be looked at. I would like to see us as board members begin to look at ourselves and begin to ask the question, why am I asking these questions? Why do I need all this other stuff? Now, if we want a research person. We have a research team. We have people here who are hired, paid, and the superintendent runs this in order for it to be able to be done. But if we're gonna come up and take every little piece and begin to look at every little nitpicky thing every time we have a board meeting, we have been dealing with this budget now for about an hour and a half. We've had it for longer than a month. We have had an opportunity to review this packet, to ask any questions, and I agree with the superintendent. It is not fair to have a thousand questions come the morning of a board meeting and expect for it to be answered. And then we have to begin to say, what is this all about? Is there another motive? And I'm not saying that there is or not, but then I would like for us to ask ourselves, what is really going on here? Is, if, are we an educational system or a research organization? And to have this, this staff and the administration to constantly be put under this extra added pressure every month to do all this research, then we might as well hire a research firm. I am not one that's behind trying to hire someone to do research and be a paper fetcher and pull all this stuff together for the sake of satisfying what? Satisfying who? Who are we trying to impress? We're not here to be impressive. We're here to be able to rear boys and girls to be able to be academically sound, to be achieved, to achieve, to be able to be competitive in a global society. And guess what? None of them and most of the parents could care less about all the research that the board needs in order to satisfy whatever you're trying to satisfy. We've got to begin to look at that. And then we've got to stop at the 11th hour coming up with these last minute things that drags this meeting on every month and we've had enough time to ask ask those questions and I agree with the superintendent. What do we do with it when we get it? What is the difference does it make? Does it enhance something? Are we trying to prove something to someone out there? I think most certainly we have our constituents who are smart enough to know that if they have questions that need to be asked, I was just reading some on my email, that they're gonna email in and ask the questions and we're responding. But we've got to make sure that we're prudent in what we're doing and what we're trying to do and we've got to begin to look at, and I challenge each of us, include myself as a board member, look inside yourself and ask the question, why am I asking these questions? What am I gonna do with it? What impact would this have on student achievement and growth? Is this actually enhancing the classroom? Is this enhancing teacher, students, parents, and the community in the Cab County School District as a whole? So if we ask that question, let's look at the answers that we come up with and we ask the questions of ourselves, then we'll decide do we need to keep going back and forth every month with this research metrics and all of that, which is important. 
but we have to give it an opportunity to hear from what's going on. And I think too often what we do, we put the cart before the horse instead of looking at, this is why we have a board meeting, this is why we have an agenda, to see what's coming next on the agenda. And we try to change everything the minute the night of a board meeting, and this has been going on too often, I would like to see us begin to look at it, ask ourselves the question, and begin to make some turns in a different direction. Mr. McMahon. Thank you, Chairman. I think it would be prudent as a possible solution for this, just for the board members to uh, go over their notes over the past 12 months to see if you have any items that you have requested that you have still not gotten the results or the information that have been requested. And we'll compile a list of items and we'll, and, and just as Dr. Morley said, let's think about why we're asking it. What's it gonna do to, for growth and achievement, student achievement, and then we'll submit that to the superintendent and ask for a timeline for expectations of, of communication. And I think it's a wonderful discussion we're having and I look forward to collaborating with the administration and we'll get a, get a solution. Any further discussion? Um, so where are we with Mr. Mayfield's request? Uh, no, I, I just simply asked for a board discussion on okay. those questions and I think okay. we've had. Yeah. Okay, we had the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> loud, and, you got it loud and clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Bell. <laughs> Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. So <laughs> the first part of that, of course, was the presentation of the proposed budget to the tentative budget, and we would request that uh, y'all would pass the tentative budget document, and then for the next, well, between now and June 26, uh, consider that document, however you want to do it, uh, for passage of a final budget on June 26. I'm sorry, 25th? I must be a year off now. <laughs> Whatever <laughs> Margaret says. Do we have any f um, further discussion on the proposed budget? Hearing none, is there any opposition to placing this item on the consent agenda for this evening? Hearing none, this item will be placed on the consent agenda. <laughs> 